The idea behind reduced impact AI is that if we can actually define what it means and make it work, we don't actually have to solve the full um, AI control problem to get um, safe AI that we can do stuff with. Um, so, and a whole host of goals which are extraordinarily unsafe on their own become safe with combined with reduced impact AI, um, like optimize the production of this factory, um, fi uh, cure this uh, one person's sickness, all those kind of things, if they're done with a reduced impact are safe, if they're done without a reduced impact and super intelligence and whatever are not. Um, the basic idea is that the AI has a meta utility function U, which is some U, U, which is our goal that we give it, plus some penalty function, which I've called R for confusing reasons, um, and a certain weight to that. Uh, penalty function. Uh, actually, that's minus. So this measures its impact and it wants to maximize this while not maximizing that and trade off against the two. We probably want you to be bounded um, in practice to prevent there being a possibility to get a huge bonus here that would overwhelm whatever penalty it might be. Uh, now, in looking at reduced impact, you do normally want to compare what would happen if the AI did stuff with what would happen if the AI didn't do stuff. And that might be a bit complicated to define the contrast. So what, it's normally, what I'm normally going to go is something that would turn on the AI off and on. So I'll call this event x and this event not x. So contrasting a world in which the AI is turned on with a world in which it isn't. And reduce impact, most of the methods are basically trying to measure a difference between those two worlds and motivating the AI to keep it small. Now, philosophically, the problem with reduced impact is that it makes no sense because as soon as you've changed one thing about the world, this precolates everywhere and you end up with a completely different world from what you started with. So you can't have a perfect measure. Nevertheless, um, there may be ways of getting approximate measures, which we're getting to now. The first one, um, if anybody's recording the talks, I assume we can link them to the paper so I don't need to write up everything. So, hello people who are listening. Uh, um, the first one is coarse graining or the 20 billion question methods. Oh, uh, at this point in the talk, some of the methods I suggest you might think are too powerful and will make the AI completely useless. Um, we'll get to, to that issue in the next part of the talk, so don't worry about that issue at the moment. So the first one is 20 billion questions. You would basically want to get lots and lots of random facts about the world. Um, air temperature, air pressure, stock market prices, uh, Oscar acceptance speeches, a whole host of different numbers that characterize the world or the universe. And you get as many of these as you can. And you then use these vectors to define a world. And the basic idea for there being reduced impact is that the numbers in a world where the AI is on must be similar to the AI, uh, world in which the AI is off. Um, some people have compared this to the idea of patching when you have an idea. This will be a safe and brilliant AI. Uh, AI. Oh, but what if it does that? Oh, we'll, we'll add an extra patch on that. Or what if it goes there and then we'll add an extra patch on that? In a sense it is, but here I'm applying every single patch imaginable ahead of time. So it's all the patches. 
Um, and the other advantage is that it doesn't actually need to be very precise in a semantic sense on what all these numbers mean. If we define the Shanghai Stock Exchange um, closing numbers in a way that's rather <clears throat> loose and ill-defined and that the AI could hack if it wanted to, that still doesn't matter be, uh, because the idea is that the AI still can't hack that definition without having to expand and grab the universe and change stuff that would be detected uh, by, these, uh, by these variables. So it's not a safe thing for, say, a super intelligent AI that already owns the world because they can presumably set these variables with enough fine control. The idea is that it would be impossible for an AI to expand and grab the world without messing them up along the way. Um, the, sec uh, the second bit, uh, idea for reduced impact, is the importance of knowing X. So the fact as to whether X happened or didn't happen tells us whether the AI is on or off. And this measurement is just, is X a particularly important fact about the world compared with any other fact? In order to measure importance, uh, you, could, you could take a bunch of utility functions and you could say for each one, um, that is this utility function modified much by knowing x or knowing not x? Again, if you get a sufficient depth of utility functions, you might be able to capture um, whether x is an important fact. And if x is not an important fact, i.e. whether the AI is on or off is not an important fact compared with any other fact that you have, then presumably the AI has had a very reduced impact. Um, then there is um, one of the conceptually interesting, though maybe a bit difficult to implement, the idea that undetectable means unimpactful. All these things, by the way, are going to involve putting the AI inside a box. Now normally when you box an AI the idea is to keep it contained but here the idea is to reduce the difference between a world X and not X. So it's not so much the AI is in the box to keep it, there's the AI in the box to shield it from our sight so that we don't know if it's on or off so that there is at least a presumed possibility that it could be in the not X world. And then the question is, is say you took a slice of space-time 50 years in the future um, and you started sampling from this space, could you, and by you I mean some idealized agent, detect that the AI was turned on or not at this point? Um, via sampling in this space. So basically, does the AI leave a trace in the universe? And if the AI doesn't leave a trace or doesn't leave a strong trace in the universe, then again, the assumption is it must have had a very small impact. The world X and not X must be very similar if you can't tell the difference. Um, and lastly, there is some abstract uh, comparison of distributions. This feels much weaker than the other methods, but um, could, should be uh, mentioned. It's basically, this has a certain distribution of possible worlds, this has a certain distribution of possible worlds. Abstractly, what are their features? Can they be compared? Is there maybe some cross-entropy, which is a less abstract comparison? But basically, are they very different? This is more because there are a lot of methods for extracting features of distributions that you could maybe hit it with. Um, I find it a little bit iffy because you can set up things to have a distribution with certain features um, if you wanted to, but it is possible maybe to combine that with the 20 billion questions um, to get something nice. Anyway, that's the reduced impact idea. The next step is some of these um, really cripple the AI, uh, especially if, for instance, you want the AI to cure someone of cancer. 
maybe the person is unimportant and they won't go on to do much, but hey, we've cured cancer, is something that is likely to leave a few ripples through the world. So how can we actually get some, some impact from uh, reduced impact? Now, the first method, which is not a method that I think is likely to work, is to calibrate mu. So toggle, toggle the penalty the coefficient of the penalty function here. If you turn it over here, you're likely to get something where the AI does absolutely nothing. If you turn it over here, you're going to get something where the AI is unconstrained by reduced impact. And the idea is that somewhere in the middle you'll find a sweet spot where there's a balance between the two. Now the problem with that is that the sweet spot may be incredibly fine. And you may not, even when it, and as you turn it around, you may s go in one step from no impact to um, extremely dangerous uh, AI. The second um, idea is the unsafe output channel. Here, the AI is granted an output channel. And the contents of the output channel are deliberately excluded from the reduced impact measure. There's a variety of ways of doing that in the equations. Um, so basically, this bit does not contribute to the reduced impact. It must be, so the reduced impact is a reduced impact on everything except for that output. Now, this out means that the output is not safe <laughs> by definition but it means that the AI ha will not use other tools to get out or manipulate um, other than the output channel. If you have this sort of thing, you can turn this factor up a lot and constrain it from doing anything except for the output channel. As I say, output channel is not safe, but if you plug it into certain things like answering certain questions in certain ways, uh, we might still be able to get lots of good stuff from that. Um, the second idea is to have what I called fixed outputs and conditioning on the results. So here um, we insert this term into the various equations in a way that its contribution is, is cancelled, is removed. In another uh, uh, setup, we, give the, uh, we don't li give the AI unconstrained ability to emit a message, but it chooses from a variety of messages that it's been given. Like, for instance, if we said which, which company should we invest in in order to win a million dollars, um, and we give it a thousand or a million companies that it can suggest, and then we get its output, and maybe in a year's time, if we are successful in our investment, we say, wow, that worked, and we press a button and say, yes, that worked. Then we can condition on that button being pressed, say. So we aim to have a reduced impact, given that in a year's time, someone has pressed the button saying, yes, that worked. What this gives us is that it gives us a calibration as to how much better the AI is than randomness. Because if we've given it a thousand message, the random message is one in a thousand. So it concentrates probability by a factor of a thousand at most. So we have, we, uh, and this does not allow it to send us any unrestricted output. So I think that things like that could actually be quite successful um, at working once there's a little issue with different estimates of probability by different agents, but um, I feel that this could work quite well. Finally, we get to the more exotic, um, this may, you might want to look at because there's pictures um, of them. Uh, that, that one's a picture of the AI in the future, the AI that's undetectable. 
but uh, you want the one where there's two computers and a laser. This one? No. Yes, there. So this setup is two computers and they want to aim a laser at an asteroid that's heading towards Earth and we want to destroy it. Now this is something that's going to have a large impact if they successfully um, hit the asteroid. So it seems that you shouldn't be able to do reduced impact in this situation. But it seems you can. Um, the one way you can do it is that you can get this um, computer to just do the X coordinates of aiming the laser and this one only doing the Y coordinates. Yes, I know that's not how you aim in 3D, but on a small on a small enough uh, uh, window that uh, would work. And if the event of this computer being turned on is Y vs non-Y, and this one is X vs non-X, then you can motivate them to output the right coordinates, that's the little U, and you can condition their reduced impact on the other computer never being turned on. So from their perspective, if they output the correct X coordinate, the laser is still going to miss because there's not going to be a correct Y coordinate from the other computer. So they still have the motivation to reduce impact, but they're fine with outputting the correct coordinates because it's still not going to hit the asteroid. However, when they're both combined together, we get the right coordinates and we hit the asteroid. So that's the picture with the computers. Just below it is a computer is a picture with robots with the same motivations and the robots one does not work. Because here the computers do not know that the other one is on. They're operating conditional on it being off and they don't have direct evidence that this is wrong. If they were robots and were walking around, or they were subroutines, then they had, they would realize that, hey, that agent is on, and then they would enter a rather undefined state. Depending on how you conditioned on this, you can get very entertaining behavior when confronted with evidence that it's not the case. But yeah, so this is those. I have tried to extend it to robots in various ways of extending natural concepts. That was when I was worrying about blue and uh, Gru and Bleen, uh, but I don't think that was particularly successful. Right, um, then there's some issues. Um, the issues are that. Um, this is not a utility function. The penalty function um, is not a utility function, uh, though it can be, depending on how you express it, it's often defined in terms of the agent's own probability module, uh, P primed. Um, therefore, the utility has an actual probability term inside it, uh, and this could lead to instability. Uh, as it modifies itself or creates sub-agents or things like that. Um, finally, there's a worry that you could have AIs that chain together to get a large impact from very small individual impacts. Um, but you, you can deal with that if you suspect it's going on and there's various ways of um, breaking a causal trades which they might be tempted to engage in but um, it's still something you have to think about and uh, take precautions against. Right, that's the rapid overview. And um, now, time for questions. Thank you.